Garden Success is brought to you in part by the Arbor Gate, featuring unusual plants, artisan-created decorative pieces, and a constantly changing array of items that bring beauty, comfort, and even flavor to the home and garden. Arbor Gate, 15635 FM 2920, Tomball, Texas, 281-351-8851 or arborgate.com. Garden Success is also brought to you by the Farm Patch, 3519 South College Avenue in Bryan, 979-822-7209. Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Well, hello and welcome to Garden Success. You know, this is a call-in show, so we would love to have you call in. Maybe you are one of the many folks that just listens but doesn't call in. So we're going to ask, uh, go ahead and give us a call. Let's hear your questions. Uh, somebody else will have the same questions you do. So I want to invite folks that have never called in before to give us a shot today. And let's see what we can talk about. Anything, gardening, vegetables, flowers, fruit, fruit tree, fruit trees and vines and bushes, that is. Uh, we could talk about uh, your lawn and uh, any anything around the yard. And let, let, let's even open up house plants today. Well, I tell you, COVID has us locked in our doors in, indoors for a long time. Now, of course, we're getting out a little more. Uh, but house plants took off as a popular plant uh, in gardens. Uh, are in gardens, in homes. Uh, a lot of folks that had never really been that interested before suddenly found they were the perfect thing for COVID season because uh, that was a, a chance to, while you're whole up inside, you can at least have something to grow and mess with uh, as a uh, kind of a budding horticulturist in a new way. So I, I found houseplants to be a, kind of a relearning curve for me. You know, all of our People just almost never call about houseplants or, or email me at the extension office about houseplants. That's a rare question. And uh, suddenly we have all these plants on the market that people are interested in that are very um, uh, unusual, maybe new. Uh, they're not your typical houseplants that we have. And I would, uh, I would have to kind of brush up on that a little bit. Anyway, uh, whatever you want to call, let's talk to you today. It's 979 979- 845-5689, 845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at t-a-m-u dot e-d-u. And uh, if you do contact me by email, please um, attach photos rather than embed them into your email. It makes it easier while I'm trying to do the show to also open an email uh, photo and, and take a look at it. Uh, I would appreciate that. And uh, sometimes folks will send their uh, email, and what I end up with is kind of a Verizon address, and I don't have your name or anything, and it's a different file that has to be opened. So if you can do it from the computer, it's a little bit better uh, for that, unless unless you have just a standard email. Well, I got a lot of things I want to talk about today, but uh, the first thing is is the break in the weather. Uh, we are about to get some cool weather. Uh, I say almost cold. Maybe maybe I could call it cold for one night uh, coming up on Saturday night, uh, and it's going to get down into the upper 30s. And an interesting thing is it even in the upper 30s. Now, who knows exactly what the temperature is going to be? It seems to have been inching up with the forecast day by day. At one point, it was 37, and now they're saying 39. Uh, depending on who you ask, you get a different number. Uh, but when temperatures get down even to the mid to upper 30s, uh, we can have a frost still. And that kind of catches people by surprise, because what is frost? Well, frost is frozen water, uh, right? And so how can you have frozen water if the air is not free freezing temperatures, like if it's not below 32? Well, the way that happens is that uh, on a cold night, the surfaces, let's say, of the leaves of one of your plants, the upper surfaces exposed to the sky, uh, they radiate heat out and up. And they can actually radiate heat 
fast enough so that the temperature of that leaf surface drops below the temperature of the air around it. So now we have a below freezing uh, surface temperature and so moisture in the atmosphere uh, condenses and freezes on that leaf surface and thus we have frost even when we don't have a freeze. And it's not a, a uh, something that you think about a lot of times but it just is a reminder that even on nights when it's not going to freeze uh, you can have some plant damage once we get down there in the 30s especially. Uh, I guess technically it, it could go up to about 40, I believe, but um, that's, that's outside my area of expertise for sure. But anyway, so you might want to be ready just in case it does get a little colder than they're currently forecasting uh, on Saturday night to cover some of your more tender plants up. And that would be things like a tomato plant or, uh, you know, sweet potatoes, whether it's the ornamental vine or sweet potatoes in your garden, they are super frost sensitive. Uh, the um, uh, marigolds, there's just a lot of plants out there that, that uh, can suffer from, from frost damage. Uh, but I, I found that to be an interesting phenomenon that, that you could have a frost without a freeze. And so now you know. So the next time you go to a party and you want to be the Cliff Clavin of the party, remember the show Cheers, Cliff Clavin, the, the uh, mailman? Well, you can be the Cliff Clavin of the party by droning on and on about how you can have a frost without a freeze. So just one of the many services we offer here on the show. Uh, give us a call, 845-5689, 845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. Garden success at tamu.edu. Uh, I've had some different folks that have, have uh, emailed me about uh, trying to get to a show that they, they can't find, and we're working on seeing if we can get those loaded up online. Uh, we'll just have to see. We'll do our best of it. If you had a question that was answered during that show, please re-email me, and uh, I'll try to pick it up and answer it again uh, on a future show. Or just give me a call today. That would be great. Uh, let's see, we had some things that I, I wanted to mention in the vegetable garden. We're, we're entering that time where it's going to be cooling off a lot soon. And so because we're going to get a pretty significant uh, cool down, uh, we're, we're, a lot of the things we would plant through the cool season are going to move very slowly after planting them. Uh, and so you can grow lettuce and, and you can grow spinach and you can grow uh, some of the root vegetables as well into the cold, cold season, but you're going to need to provide them some covering and they're not going to move very fast. That's why we like to plant some of the blue leaf vegetables like broccoli and things back in September, October, because it's mild, uh, the temperatures are mild and they grow really fast. And so as a result, we get good results uh, in terms of fast production. So you can still plant all those things now. That would include broccoli and Brussels sprouts and cabbage and, and uh, the um, uh, 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 carrots, for example, can still be planted as a root crop now. Cauliflower uh, and uh, collards, those are all the blue leaf vegetables we're talking about, including kale and kohlrabi. Uh, you can also be planting lettuce and spinach, as I mentioned uh, right now. Uh, mustard can still go in at this time of the year. And if you got multiplying onions, boy, you better hurry up and get them in. We're a little past their time, but, but you can still get them in the ground at least. Um, then what's left is some root crops like the radishes uh, and uh, turnips, for example, can still be planted at this time of the year. Uh, just know they're going to move a little slower. So one of the things you may want to do is have them under uh, some sort of a, like a clear cover uh, that's partially uh, vented so it doesn't get too hot and that way they can move a little bit faster if you're growing them uh, out there in the ground. Excuse me, I had something on my throat. I lost for a minute. Uh, so in the vegetable garden also because things are slowing down or are gonna slow down pretty soon um, you want to give a little extra boost of small doses of nitrogen in the cool season. Now, if you're growing, uh, for example, if you still have English peas or snow peas or snap peas, those cool season peas, uh, because they're legumes, we don't want to push them with too much nitrogen. But uh, for a lot of the vegetables, uh, it kind of can help boost the growth because microbial activity in the soil slows down a little bit as the soil gets cooler. 
Uh, and so that, that would just give you a little bit of a boost to grow. Small doses of that. Uh, if you're using an organic nitrogen, because it's microbially broken down, uh, it is going to be very slow to respond. It's going to take quite a, uh, a bit of a delay compared to what it would do uh, if you applied it, uh, let's say, uh, uh, in spring or summer uh, time. Uh, so just kind of keep that uh, in mind as well. Uh, the, so in addition to the fertilizing, you want to watch for some of the pests that we see this time of the year. And of course, uh, the loopers, the little inchworm type caterpillars love all those blue leaf vegetables that I mentioned. Uh, and so you want to watch for those. Uh, you know, if you just have a few plants, you can hand pick those things off and squish them. And there's no need to buy spray and mix spray and and all that kind of stuff for just a few plants. Uh, but if you do spray, uh, sprays with uh, BT, B as in boy, T as in Tom, uh, BT in them are a natural um, disease of caterpillars. And so you spray it on the foliage and they eat it. So it's a disease. So getting it on the outside of the caterpillar is not helpful. You want to get it inside the caterpillar. So spray it on the leaves. Caterpillar eats the leaves, and it takes care of them. And that works all through the year on any caterpillars that you're trying to get rid of. One thing about BT is the earlier you spray it in the caterpillar's life, the more effective it is. Caterpillars, you know, hatch out of an egg and then go through various stages as they grow larger. And then eventually they go into their pupa and are chrysalis and they, they uh, then become a butterfly or a moth. Most of the, in fact, all the pests in our vegetable garden are, are in the moth category. Uh, I can't think of a single butterfly that's a pest in the vegetable garden. But um, so once they get older, that BT is not as effective. And so that's another reason why we say the best, uh, you know, we always say the best fertilizer is the footprints of the gardener, but also the best pest control is the footprints of the gardener. And this, you can apply it year round, but if, if you watch your garden, check on your garden periodically, and take prompt action at the first sign of a problem, you have a lot more options for control. Your options tend to be, in general, less toxic, uh, uh, be, you know, like for example, BT uh, would would work well, but as those caterpillars get older, you may have to use something a little bit stronger that would be effective against them. Uh, so more options, uh, uh, somewhat less toxic options in some cases, uh, and you've lo you've lost less of your plant. If you wait until those cabbage leaves look like Swiss cheese, well, you might kill the caterpillar, but you just lost a, a, a good chunk of your of your cabbage or whatever crop that they happen to be on. So early detection and action is always a good thing. And it, this is true uh, of our lawns. It's true of, of uh, pests of the flower garden and herbs and trees and anything else. And speaking of the lawns, uh, I'm getting a lot of calls about the circles in the lawn that uh, we used to call brown patch. Now we call large patch. Uh, is the, the common rhizoctonia that we're seeing in our lawns now is a large patch. And uh, people are asking what to do. Well, once, once those circles appear, uh, there's not much you can do. Uh, that disease likes milder temperatures and moisture and uh, uh, succulent grass tissues. So when you water a lot and you fertilize a lot, it seems to make it worse. Uh, it occurs typically in the fall and the spring, but when it, hap when it happens, what it's doing is it's rotting the leaves off of your St. Augustine runners. So when the leaves are rotted off, the spot turns tan. We say brown, but it's really kind of tannish brown. Uh, and those, if you sprayed it and killed all the disease instantly, which of course is not going to happen, but if you did that, it would still look the same through the winter, pretty much. Sometimes in milder weather, it'll start to regreen a little in the center of the circles. But basically, when you get a big round ugly on the lawn, you're going to have a big round ugly until spring when new growth fills in. It's not killing the grass. It's just rotting the leaves off. So if you don't want to look at that all winter, then you need to deal with it early in the season. Uh, by the time we get to the end of September, I start looking for those circles. Uh, and in October, typically it's going to be October when you really see them. But at the first sign, uh, some people just spray every year at that time. I tend to not like uh, giving advice of, well, every year in early October spray for large patch. 
because I just think that probably ends up in an uh, unnecessary amount of pesticide application. But I watch for it around my neighborhood and in my own yard, and the first sign of a little something appearing, I go ahead and treat the lawn. Uh, because it very quickly those those patches appear and they grow in size and larger and so shutting it down early is important. Our products that manage brown patch or large patch are are not curative. They don't put green leaves back on the runner. The, what they do is they shut things down and they prevent infection for a small a short period of time. So when you put the some of the better products in on your lawn that are fungicidal uh, then not only is it shutting down anything that might be getting started right then, but it's it's preventing additional infection for the coming uh, week or two, or it depends on which product you use as to how, how long they last. Some are sy sy uh, systemic, and so they, they stick around for a little bit longer working. That's a lot about large patch, but boy, we sure have a lot of large patch questions every year, and, and that's definitely been the case uh, this year as well. Uh, our number is 845-5689, 845-5689, or by email you can reach us at gardensuccess at tamu.edu, gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And let's go to the phones now and uh, talk to Greg. Hello, Greg. Good afternoon. Hey, what's up? I, I just sent you a photo. I think it's a Leyland cypress, or however you pronounce it. Okay. Uh, it's it occasionally, well, too often actually has uh, limbs that just go totally from the green to the brown. It's it's very sporadic, but they do occur on a regular enough basis that I don't know if it's what exactly is attacking that cypress uh, bush okay. plant, or what you want to call it. Okay. Well, let me let me uh, answer that, and in the meantime, kind of check that email. I have not received it, so okay. uh, maybe it, it needs to go to Garden Success one word at tamu.edu. So Leyland cypress is is a tree that, when it's young, looks a lot like a little Christmas tree shape, and sure, it get sure it, <laughs> it gets huge. In fact, it they sell them as Christmas trees in East Texas. It's one of the one of the Christmas tree looking things that we can grow here in Texas that um, uh, growers uh, grow and, and sell. But as it grows, it gets larger. And that's if I'm going to answer more than your question. Other people may be thinking about planting one. Just keep in mind that they grow huge. And so you need to have space for them. Uh, they like a lot of the arborvitae and juniper, those kinds of cedar, those kinds of plants. The arborvitaes and junipers get a blights of the foliage. And so that's a fungal disease and it, it can kill uh, the little twigs and then everything out from that turns brown. And so you see a green plant and then you have these little blighted ends of branches, maybe here and there, maybe everywhere. Uh, and that's a fungal disease that you would have to spray for, which can be a little bit tedious to do. Uh, the sanitary measure is to go in with pruners and go in back into the green just a little bit uh, and, and prune those branches out. And you get the disease inoculum that's in those branches at least out of the plant itself. Uh, you know, throw those away. And uh, then uh, the plant uh, doesn't have the same disease pressure. But things like Leland are kind of prone to that. And so uh, so are a lot of our junipers and arborvitaes. The other thing that can happen sometimes is you get spider mites that can affect some of these plants, but that generally is a slow loss of color, not so much a quick browning of the, le of the leaves or, or needle-like, scale-like needles, um, but more of, a, of just a gradual going from green toward a, a whitish tan uh, color and eventually brown. So I don't know if you found the photo or, or the email. It, it looks like it went through. So okay. Know. Well, who knows? It, it's, in, it's caught in cyberspace by, by the gremlins. Well, uh, I, I guess I'm a slow learner in that we had planted three of them. What's the Italian cypress, the ones that grow tall and skinny? Yes. The one? Yes. That's well, right. We had planted those, and they were successful for several years, and then whatever you're describing. Yes must have hit them hard. Yes, and the other thing that hits those and a lot of other plants as well are the bagworms. Those are the little things that dangle like a 
skinny Christmas ornament from the branches because they have a caterpillar inside and they they literally eat all the green uh, scaly uh, foliage off of the plant and you have these big brown areas but you see the little bagworms hanging there uh, when they're present anytime that a juniper or variety uh, pine tree you know all of those kinds of evergreens when they lose the green needles or the green scaly foliage and and they're it's either taken completely off or it's killed back to where there's not green, that branch won't regrow. Unlike other trees, you could prune them back to a hat rack and they sprout out again. Yeah. This one is only going to produce new shoots from, from where there are living needles. So uh, when a blight, why, the reason I mention that is when a blight hits or when bagworms feed on the foliage and you get this big brown spot, the only thing that could happen over time is growth from the sides kind of tends to fill in. But that happens really slowly and generally unacceptably. And Leland cypress can be a beautiful uh, Mediterranean-looking uh, stately uh, plant in the landscape. I'm sorry, Leland cypress, uh, Italian cypress that you were mentioning. But they always get these problems. It, it's just a matter of when. And so I've seen people put them all down the property line and then one of them does this and then another one starts to do it. And so are you going to replace them? And now you're starting with a little plant when you got the big ones and, uh, you know, it just, there's no fixing it when that starts to happen aesthetically. Well, I agree. And I think I'd, I'd heard elsewhere that once again, there's no regrowth of that. If you have to have to prune heavily enough to take out the dead branches, yeah. you will likely just have a void there. Yeah, you will. Nothing else. That that sure happens. Even even Christmas tree growers, when they hedge the trees, to sh when they shear them to make them that shape, uh, if they shear too deep and they cut back behind living needles, throw that one away. It'll never make a tree, a Christmas tree. But you mentioned a fungal treatment, but is that something that, uh, you know, like a, a fine locally at co-op or farm patch or someplace? Or you know, I I would, the, the best answer is that you would take some of the branches and, and send them to the state plant clinic, the, the diagnostic lab here at Texas A&M, and let them identify specifically which uh, disease is causing that. Uh, there are several fungal diseases that can cause it. And it may be that the recommendation may vary a little bit depending on what's causing it. Uh, we often recommend kind of some generic fungicides that tend to work on a wide range of, of fungal problems. Uh, and, and so that would be an option. But, um, you know, I've seen these problems in, in production nurseries where, you know, where we have all the pots on the ground. And it's a whole bunch of spreading junipers, for example. And they start to get this. And you just got to get in there and prune all of it out and get all the debris. Don't leave it laying on the ground because it's just going to splash back up. And then treat your plants uh, with the fungicide and be ready to do it again. But keep in mind that this Leyland you have came in looking nice and probably looked nice for a good while. Uh, and so even if you completely got that disease out of the tree, it, it may well show back up again. Uh, that's not what you want to hear, right? <laughs> well, now, trust me, I've had enough failures in gardening that I'm used to it. <laughs> so, so have I. You got to kill a lot of plants to be a gar good gardener. I'm just thinking. Yes, I'm just indeed. Saying. Well, this one, barring the problems I'm having, this one has grown. Like you mentioned, it was used as a uh, privacy along a county road, you know, for a, to take yes. up a view and whatever. And oh, it they're... did its job. Oh man, do uh, they? They're great for that. And, and yes, and so it looks spectacular other than the ugly brown occasional branch. And again, it can be a six inch tip of one, or unfortunately, I didn't catch this last one, and it's in the picture if you ever get it. And it's, a prob it's probably, you know, a, 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 almost a two foot long branch that's as brown as can be, and the rest of the tree is green as can be. So. Oh, man. That's, that is, uh, <laughs> that's unfortunate. So okay, well, I, thanks I don't. For, thanks for the. I don't have any good news for you, other than if you if you want to go ahead and email me at the extension office, I can give you a few fungal fungicide options uh, uh, that you can use until that Leland outgrows your spray wand. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, sir. Thank you. Let's go back to the phones. The number eight four five five six eight nine, and we're going to talk to Kate. Hello, Kate. Hello. Um, I've spoken to you in the past about larkspur seeds. 
Okay. And I'd been advised to spread them in November, which I did. And I don't know if it's because the weather's been so warm, but I have seedling sprouts. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what's going to happen to them when uh, we get frost and freeze. They're going to be fine most of the time. Now, when when we went through that, of course, we had snow cover, which probably would have saved them even last year. But um, when, when we have a severe cold, you can get some damage to them or maybe kill them outright. But most years they survive it, and we have a number. They're, they're a biennial, and we have a number of biennials. Uh, uh, the uh, poppies are biennials. The blue bonnets, our state flower, is a biennial, and so every winter, those plants have little baby plants out there in nature or in the garden, uh, and they they are made to survive it. And so the uh, the larkspur, uh, the sweet peas. That uh, for flowers, that is, and uh, those are things I normally recommend fall planting. If if you did have a loss of your, I'll call it a crop, uh, you could replant in the spring, but you're going to have much better blooming in plants if you plant them in the fall like you did. Well, this is my first experiment with the fall. I, For years, I had been doing it in the spring, mm-hmm. so fingers crossed, I guess, you know, logically thinking, with other plants, the new tender growth is the more susceptible to cold. So I was worried about this. Thanks for the reassurance. Okay. My well, second question is coffee grounds. Mm-hmm. I'm a coffee drinker. I throw the used grounds out every morning. Could I throw those into my garden? Yes. Um, coffee grounds are organic matter. And to put a small amount out, you know, I wouldn't put them two inches deep for sure, but to put a little scattering out here and there is fine. It, it actually, they'll have, they have some nitrogen and a lot of other nutrients, just like any living tissues have. Uh, and so they're fine for, just don't overdo it. You know, don't have a pot plant and have 20% <laughs> of your soil volume be coffee grounds. No. But, in, you know, and it, it does, it decomposes the microbes, uh, they decompose it. In fact, uh, uh, I like to kid around and say that uh, when you use coffee grounds, the microbes stay up all night working and it even decomposes <laughs> faster. <laughs> you are too much, Skip. Oh, I'm thank you. Up. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Kate. I <laughs> appreciate the call. Oh, my goodness. Hey, uh, I have one, got an email from uh, Phyllis, and uh, it, it came in with that phone number where I can't tell who. Phyllis, I need you to resend me the photos. I'm, I uh, somehow have not been able to see the photos of the thing that you were talking about, but it's a type of mushroom. Uh, also, uh, Catherine had emailed and asked uh, about uh, a, a weed that's a nutgrass-like weed, but not nutgrass, on the top of it. There are little uh, kind of pointy balls, like something the size of an English pea, but it's got little spikes on it. And that is a, that is a plant called Kylinga. And Kylinga is closely related to sedges. So sedges would be things like nut grass or nut, it's really nut sedge, uh, a purple nut sedge, yellow nut sedge. And then there are other sedges that we use ornamentally, like Berkeley sedge and Texas sedge. They make nice little, uh, maybe you would use them like you would use liriope, for example, uh, to, to border a bed or to make a solid ground cover. But anyway, the Kylinga is a, is a very difficult to control weed. Uh, nut grass is, nut sedge is too, uh, but Kylinga in yards uh, is a problem. And if you, if you go to the Aggie Turf website, I believe it's aggieturf.tamu.edu. Uh, I believe that's it. There's a weed section you can look at, and there's pictures of more common weeds that we run into. Uh, and also there's a section on uh, of publications, and there's some really good turf weed control publications that you can download for free, like many of our AgriLife publications. And you can see pictures, and it tells you what to do about it and all of that. Kalinga, like uh, some of our nuts edges, especially the yellow, uh, like wet soil. And they so if you've got an area that's low uh, and tends to collect water, uh, or maybe a heavy clay where water tends to stand, or not so much 
even standing surface water, but just the soil stays extra wet, uh, you're going to have a lot of Kalinga problems. Uh, it's going to proliferate there as opposed to a, a more drier landscape where it wouldn't. So we are always telling you to not overwater your lawns, and most people do overwater. And you, so if you back off and only water when the lawn needs water, so in the heat of summer, that's about once a week, maybe twice a week, depending on, and that's in the sun. Uh, so if, if, if you water frequently, you're, you're going to make the situation such that Kailinga can even faster proliferate in your lawn. Uh, and it, it is a tough weed to control. There are products that are made for controlling sedges uh, in the lawn. Uh, Manage, uh, uh, Image are two brand examples of those that will suppress Kailinga. But with all the sedges, almost, and, and certainly with Kalinga, you're going to have to treat more than once. Uh, it, and it, it's going to, you treat it, and it takes, sometimes it takes a couple weeks to really see results. And then you're going to need later, when it's coming back, to treat it again, because you don't always kill all of the plants. Uh, but by treating it several times, you can uh, have longer-term control of it. Uh, but I always, you know, whether it's, a, it's an insect, or a disease, or a weed, our first step is a cultural step. It's something that helps prevent the problem from even occurring in the first place, or at least minimize it uh, in the first place. So for example, if you've got a thin lawn, and you've got a lot of weed problems, and you don't fix the fact that you have a thin lawn, you're going to continue to have a lawn where sunlight hits the soil. And when sunlight hits the soil, nature plants a weed. And uh, there are weeds that can ex coexist in a dense St. Augustine. But that's the exception. Uh, most weeds, when you mow water and fertilize and have a dense lawn, you have less weed problems. So whether it's uh, creating density to prevent weed seeds, or in the case of something like Kalinga, uh, really doing everything in your power. You can't control rainfall, and it can't change the fact that your soil is clay, for example. But everything in your power to uh, dry that out. And uh, the Kalinga just doesn't thrive in those conditions. It's not going to kill it all, it's, but it's going to suppress it. And uh, so uh, that that's just true in general. And, and in entomology, they call that IPM, uh, Integrated Pest Management, uh, in... Um, uh, plant pathology, they have the disease triangle, which means you have to have three things for a disease to occur, which is a susceptible plant, so plant a resistant variety if you can. You have to have uh, the presence of the disease, which a lot of our diseases are ubiquitous, but there are those that, uh, you know, you can bring in on plant material. And then thirdly, you have to have uh, the environment that's right. And for most diseases, that means uh, moisture, uh, but not, not all. Uh, so we always take our first step as cultural. And to just get on a treadmill, let's say a herbicide treadmill. Every year you treat your lawn three times, you know, with pre-emergence and post-emergence and all of that, trying to have weed-free lawn. Uh, that's just not the best approach. And in fact, a lot of the products that we would, that are labeled to use on lawns uh, can really stress your lawn. Uh, such as St. Augustine, for example, and when the temperature is above the mid-80s, there are a number of our effective weed control products that are very hard on St. Augustine. There are some of the pre-emergents that cause St. Augustine to develop clubbed roots, the roots that come off the runner instead of being able to reach down deep into the ground uh, like a root should. They just hit the surface where the, the herbicide's present, and they just kind of stunt and become like a, a club. They don't not a long tapering route. And uh, th that's, you know, of course, it's a function of people that uh, want to figure if a teaspoon's good, a tablespoon's better. In other words, uh, I don't just want to kill the weeds. I want to kill them deader than dead. You know, when you start that, you're asking uh, for problems. Uh, there are also herbicides that when you overuse them and then have rain wash them in, uh, they can get into the roots of plants. I've seen trees with significant herbicide injury uh, because they were overapplied, misapplied uh, to the lawn below. So I guess I'm, I'm just saying in, over and over again in different ways, uh, cultural practices 
are the first step in, in a successful lawn, a successful garden, uh, and it, that's where we start. And so uh, if you've got a problem that needs an emergency fix, we have pesticides to do it or herbicides to do it, but uh, ultimately your long-term, if it's not in preventing the problem, then you're just wasting time and money and, and causing unnecessary damage in the environment. So well, that was a soapbox. Our phone number is 845-5689, 845-5689, or by email, gardensuccess at tamu.edu, gardensuccess at tamu.edu. Well, let's go to the emails and see what, uh, what we can find here. Uh, if there's some of these I'm going to have to work on a little bit before I can get back to you. Uh, we had an email come in, let's see, on, on a, uh, the Christmas cactus. It doesn't have a name attached, but uh, how do you tell the difference between Thanksgiving cactus and Christmas cactus, and when is the best time to repot them? I would repot them prior to the growing season. Um, uh, so when you're going to, when it's going to kind of get out of the real cold season where the light levels are low and the temperatures can be a little cooler, uh, I don't think it matters a lot when you repot them. I've repotted them at different times, but that's probably the better time. So the difference between a Thanksgiving cactus and a kick Christmas cactus, uh, there are, are several Actually, there are three. There's also one called Easter cactus that uh, is a very similar looking plant. Uh, the, the Christmas cactus, the little flat stem pieces that you might say that's the leaf. It's not. It's the stem uh, piece. Those, the points on them are very pointed. And on a Thanksgiving cactus, they're a little more rounded. And on an Easter cactus, they're even more rounded. Uh, it, it, more like little round bumps out there, not not fingers sticking out from the stem. Uh, so that that's the best way. And if you go online uh, to a search engine and you type in difference between Thanksgiving and Christmas, you're going to see examples of what I'm talking about. But I would say that probably 90% of what I see in the market is Christmas cactus, the, the, the more pointed uh, type. Uh, of Christmas cactus. Uh, it, those are all three great plants. They're kind of fun and cool to grow. Uh, but uh, I think certainly what's in the market now would be the Christmas. I, I've often wondered, and I don't, I don't know the answer to this, but I've often wondered if maybe the Thanksgiving cactus is uh, a clued to initiate blooming with a little different day length or night length than Christmas cactus. So in other words, just like a poinsettia, when we go from summer into fall, the nights are getting longer and it, it signals that plant that it's time to set buds and bloom. And so maybe with Thanksgiving cactus, I've wondered if maybe it requires a little, um, maybe l nights that aren't as long as, as Christmas cactus would require to initiate that bud formation and blooming. Worth an investigation. I need to do that sometime. But anyway, that's that's how you can uh, tell the difference between the two. Uh, let's see here. I had a question uh, come in from, I believe it's John, or no, it's Phyllis. Okay. Well, Phyllis, I think I found your, your, <laughs> your photo. Sorry about that. I cannot tell what kind of fungus that is from the photo. Uh, it's, it's, if it's at the bottom of a crepe myrtle and between the trunks, uh, it could be several things. It's not um, oak root rot or armillaria root rot, which is good news. It could be some decomposer fungi that it's had access to the dead inner uh, wood of that, of that trunk, and it's working on that. But it is not something that I can identify by looking at it. And we get a lot of questions, and I've talked about this on the show before, about identifying fun fungus uh, growth, uh, which would be like a, the fruiting structure, the mushroom, if you will, of the of the fungus. And people want to know if it's edible or not. And uh, my two favorite, there's two kind of humorous sayings that I think both tell the story well. 
Uh, one of them is, as far as these folks going out and roaming through the woods to pick up mushrooms to eat, or someone who has it in the backyard and wants to know if it's edible or not, there are bold mushroom collectors and there are old mushroom collectors, but there's not any old bold mushroom collectors. That's one. The other one is you can eat any mushroom you see, but many of them only once. Point made. Uh, so uh, I've talked to plant pathologists about fungi. Is this edible or not? And they're kind of hesitant sometimes to answer. There are mycologists, of, of specialists in, in fungi that can look at things and they can just identify them and tell you all about what they are and everything. There's, sometimes they even look at the spore print that forms underneath that mushroom. But um, the, in general, leave it alone. Don't don't uh, try. And I know Phyllis wasn't asking about eating it, but I just thought I'd mention that because I have had quite a few uh, can you eat this um, questions that have, that have come in uh, as well. Uh, let's see. So I, I also wanted to mention something uh, about our cool season uh, flower gardens and, and cool season color. Um, this is the time of year now that the heat is gone that we can can still be planting a lot of the plants that survive the cool season. We're getting late enough to where some of the things that are hardy but not really hardy, and that would include uh, snapdragons, uh, that could include uh, alyssum, for example, uh, as cool season plants, calendula maybe. Uh, they, they can still grow here, but you're going to have to cover them uh, when we have a good hard freeze, or you should. Uh, and But then we have others that are really hardy, and that would be violas and uh, pansies and um, dusty miller. Dusty miller is, is the white frilly uh, plant that we grow for its foliage, and it's often intermixed with, with other plants like that. They, they can take cold weather. Uh, and then am among the most hardy things we have are our ornamental cabbage and kale types of plants, those kind that uh, are colorful and are planted uh, for for the color. And so uh, I would say that, you know, if, if you're going to if you're going to put in flower color now, pansies and violas are probably your best bet. I like the violas. They're smaller flowered, but they produce a more of a profusion of flowers. And so they give really good color coverage over the plant. Uh, you can also choose them in many different uh, flower forms. The pansies are the ones that almost look like a little monkey face. You know, they got the two eyes and uh, and and they come in many colors. Uh, violas, you can get them in single colors like yellow or sky sky blue. Uh, and so uh, I, I like the, and maroon, of course. You got to have maroon. So you can have a maroon and white uh, A&M right out there in the flower bed uh, just by planting them in in the right the right arrangement. Uh, now would be a good time to plant those. Whatever you have, whether you've already planted it, maybe you plant it back in October or November, or you're planting it now, uh, you want to continue to give it small doses of nutrient, especially nitrogen, uh, to keep it growing. So this would, and I mentioned this before with the vegetables, but as we go into the cold season, small doses, you know, don't dump a bunch on there, but just give them a little bit because they only take up a little bit at a time. Uh, and so a little bit. And what that does is it, it invigorates the plant. Now, temperature has a huge factor in how much a plant is going to grow. But uh, lacking for nitrogen or having adequate nitrogen makes a lot of difference, too. And so why do we want a flowering plant to grow vegetatively? Well, the reason is in order to produce flowers or fruit or roots, if we're going to move, expand this even into vegetables, that takes a lot of carbohydrates. You know, think about a carrot or a tomato. That's a lot of carbohydrates that it took to produce that. Uh, flowers, the same thing is true. For plants to initiate flowering and have big, beautiful flowers, they need carbohydrates. And you only get carbohydrates when leaves receive sunshine. So if you've got a plant, that has giant blooms all over it and very few leaves. It may look good today, but down the road, it's not going to be blooming much because it just doesn't have, uh, think of it as the solar panels out there to capture that energy and turn it into blooms. And so uh, we want to keep things growing. Uh, that 
a little side note on that is when we go to garden centers, and I know uh, I'm guilty of it too, you see all these plants and you want to pick the one with the most blooms. And I'm talking about little bedding plants. Well, we were better off picking a plant that <laughs> has almost no blooms and a lot of good foliage because in the long term, we're probably going to end up with a better plant. A plant that has the blooms, uh, especially one that would set seed and, and have to put the energy into the seed as well, uh, it, that takes away from vegetative growth, which takes away from future blooms. So don't pick your plants based on the size of the bloom. Pick your plants based on the amount of, of uh, healthy, healthy leaves and stuff uh, that it has on it. Uh, our phone number is 845-5689, uh, and by garden by email, gardensuccess at tamu.edu. I think everybody's out Christmas shopping. We're not getting a lot of calls in here today. So uh, let's, uh, let's uh, go to the email. And uh, Raymond asks, is it too late to plant crepe myrtles? And the answer is no. Uh, the best time to plant woody ornamentals, that would be tree shrubs and woody vines, uh, is in uh, mid to late fall. Winter is also a great time, and spring is probably the third choice on planting those things. You can plant year-round. You can plant a crepe myrtle any month of the year here in our area, but uh, you want to, um, you want, you, the goal is to, to have that plant get in the ground and those roots start to establish. And in our warm climate down here, our soil is never freezing uh, like, uh, like it does in some areas further north. And so those roots are establishing through the winter. I mean, they're not growing rapidly, but they're growing. And so by the time next summer comes, when every new plant, the under a year old, is struggling to survive in the heat and pump enough water and, and all that, your fall planted plant has the head start. It has the advantage. And your winter planted plant is going to have more time as well uh, to get going. Uh, with the fall planting, you've got some leaves on it but when you plant it, but the temperature is mild, so it's not hard to keep it hydrated. Uh, and those leaves are, are still actively functioning when you plant in mid-fall. And then they're going to fall off, unless it's an evergreen. Uh, but uh, get it done get it done sooner rather than later. And yes, you can plant any time. The only exception to what I just said would be things that are marginally hardy. Like, let's say, a citrus. Uh, satsuma. So, satsuma is a hardy citrus. But, uh, you know, if we're going to have winter drop down in the... In the um, uh, low 20s, it, it's going to, or mid 20s even, a brand new satsuma is going to have trouble. Uh, so you might want to hold on to that and then put it out when the danger of hard, hard freezes are past. And, and the word is might. Uh, I, if it were my yard, I'd plant it anyway, but then just be ready to cover it up. Uh, but that would be the only time when fall planting isn't the best time necessarily uh, to put something in. So I hope that... Uh, Hope that helps uh, with that question. Uh, fall is also, and, and even now, is a good time to plant herbs, uh, the perennial herbs. Uh, we've got uh, rosemary and we have, um, uh, gosh, I can't even think of herbs, thyme and oregano, uh, marjoram, those kinds of things uh, can, can go in now. And for the same reason, they, they just have a chance to get established even better. Uh, a lot of the perennials, uh, that's what we know. We put bulbs in in the fall. Uh, but if you still got bulbs you haven't planted, by all means, plant them. It's it's time. Go ahead and do it. Uh, if you've got perennial plants, maybe some salvias or or others like that, go ahead and put them in now. Let them have the winter time. Uh, we we never know how cold it's going to get in the coming winter, but it's always a good idea to mulch plants well. Uh, to put a, a good covering of mulch over the surface of the soil that holds the soil heat and we don't think we think about the temperature of the air when we have a freezing night, but the soil uh, contains a lot of warmth. And when I use the term warmth, I mean above freezing. So if the air goes down to 30 degrees, but the soil is 55 degrees, we call that warm. And then if you throw mulch over the plant's crown, the base of the perennial or the plant, and then all that warmth of, of the soil prevents that 
the base of the plant from being killed outright. And we have some plants that are that are marginally hardy here. Uh, the Pride of Barbados, also called Red Bird of Paradise, beautiful summer bloomer. Uh, it, it can be killed outright in our winters, but sometimes it comes through just okay. Uh, and so uh, that would be a good one to mulch, mulch really well. So anything marginal like that, you would, you would want to do the mulching, the mulching on. Uh, so I mentioned I mentioned the herbs and the flowers and the vegetables, and I just want to want to add one one or a few comments about our house plants. Uh, I've got a bunch of house plants that have been living on a, a shaded back uh, patio area uh, all summer, and uh, this is the time when we need to pull them in. It's going to get kind of cold on Saturday, and so by going out and and bringing those in, that helps. Now. If, if you have a uh, ficus, uh, uh, the ficus benjamina, the, the uh, smaller leaf ficus tree, or a fiddle leaf fig as another type of ficus, some of those plants, they do not take well to sudden dramatic changes in light levels. So a shaded area outdoors is much more bright than some of the brighter areas indoors in our homes. And when you make that sudden move, uh, often they'll drop leaves. It doesn't kill the plant, they come back, but they'll drop leaves. And so we generally try to change the light levels more gradually. But uh, if you've got plants outside, as I do, uh, then it, go ahead and bring those in. Uh, even if it warms up a little bit and you put them back out a little bit, you know, being in a few, few days isn't going to cause them to... Uh, drop their leaves, but uh, go ahead and bring them in. Check them for pests. Uh, if they have scale, if they have mealybugs, if they have aphids, if they have mites or whatever they might have on them, uh, you want to go ahead and deal with that outside before you bring them inside uh, because uh, those problems can become very problematic on the inside. I've got uh, some Norfolk Island pines outside that I need to repot and bring inside because uh, our over-enthusiastic um, golden retriever has knocked the pot over about three times this year and the soil is scattered everywhere else but uh, I'll, I'll complain about uh, the golden retriever some other show more I love that dog but I have not taught that dog to garden well it, it's 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 not good at planting but it's very good at unplanting things and often I've spent the day out putting perennials out in my flower beds only to come out later and find that she had very very thoughtfully, very uh, conscientiously removed the plants from the, from the soil and brought them back and now has them sitting on the back, back doorsteps. Uh, so we, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm a horticulturist, but apparently I don't teach well, so at least not for the four-legged uh, students <laughs> that might be out there. Uh, but anyway, uh, so bring those houseplants in, check them for problems, get them in the brightest light that you can. You can go online and see the variation in um, uh, different kinds of houseplants and the light levels that they take and how easy they are to grow. Uh, did a little spot uh, that's going to be on Aggie Horticulture Facebook Live tomorrow on Gifts for Gardeners. So if you go to Aggie Horticulture Facebook Live tomorrow, I believe it's at 1 o'clock that they air it, uh, it'll be on Gifts for Gardeners. And one of the things I talk about is some of our houseplants. And if you've got someone who has never grown houseplants or any plant successfully and they tell you they have a brown thumb, the plant for them is mother-in-law's tongue or sense of area. It's got the long sword-like leaves that are green, sometimes with white or yellow markings on them. Uh, if you can't grow a sense of area, we can't help you. I mean, it seriously, it is like, that is the, if you have any kind of a gardening pulse, you can grow a sense of area because they're hard to kill. Now, I've talked to people who have killed sense of areas by sticking them out in the sun and not watering them for three weeks, for example. But they take shade. I mean, they take low light, okay. They they take drought periods that, you know, okay. Uh, and they're just easy to grow. Uh, it's a very easy plant to grow. Very few uh, pr pest problems. The only plant that I can think of that's easier than Sensevaria would be a silk plant. Now, a silk plant, you, you don't have to water it. But it does get dust mites, so you might <laughs> 
you have to dust it for dust mites. Anyway, sansevieria is easy to grow. Uh, another good one is the ZZ plant. Maybe you're wanting to give a gift uh, for as a plant to some of your friends and family. ZZ is one of the, I'll say, newer popular plants that we have in the last few years. Uh, and it's also easy to grow. It takes a range of light, not as, not as tough as Sansevieria, but close to it. And, and so it's, it's a fun and easy one to grow. But if you've got someone who likes to grow the unusual or maybe has really gotten into houseplants, there are a number of ones out there that are, I find, uh, a challenge to grow, but they're really popular. Uh, and they uh, they might make a good gift as well, and you can purchase them here locally. And that would be things like the furry feathers, the um, rattlesnake plant uh, is one that, that uh, is in that category. Uh, I love all the prayer plants, the marantas and calatheas and things. Uh, that, uh, that I find them a little easier to grow than some of the other I mentioned. Uh, th but those are all those are all easy. The Swiss cheese plant. Um, that is another good one that that uh, is kind of fun to grow and popular. And then all the little string of fill in the blank, string of turtles, string of dolphins, string of pearls, string of hearts, uh, string. They're they're just they're a, a succulent, and providing enough light, they're they're pretty easy to grow too. So uh, shop around and consider a plant as a gift this year for for gardeners on your list, or or for the non gardeners. I even given you something uh, for them as well. Plants are are the kind of thing that people not don't just enjoy when they unwrap them; they enjoy uh, for years to come. Uh, give them a nice, attractive pot along with it. So I just, uh, that's, that's free advice for holiday, holiday gift giving uh, there on the plants. Uh, as, we, as we approach uh, the, the winter season, uh, we're uh, at a time where I know everybody's busy with uh, different things, shopping and parties and gatherings or whatever you are doing this month. Uh, but this is a good time to order your seeds. A lot of the seed catalogs have started to come in. And if you are looking for seeds that are unusual, maybe they're not available at our local garden centers, uh, and I would start with the local garden centers with your shopping, uh, you may have to order them from online seed catalogs. And the sooner you order, the better, uh, because they run out of some things. Now, this isn't going to be a seed shortage year like we had when COVID first hit. But every year, uh, companies run out of some of the newer, more popular, more unusual kinds of things. So you want to get those orders in in plenty early. And if you uh, have some questions about uh, certain kinds of things you want to grow, you can email us at the Extension Office. And I can suggest some places where you might buy uh, the, the particular kinds of seeds you're looking for. Uh, but always ask at your local garden center and nursery. Uh, find out what they carry. Uh, and make sure that you're growing things that do well in our area. That's a that's a big a big a big factor, a big deal. Uh, just because you've heard of a plant variety doesn't mean it grows well here. And so we we always want to plant things that give us the best uh, chance of success. But you want to get those seeds in because even for things like next year's tomato crop, it won't be long after the first of the year when we're planting them indoors to grow transplants for that. Well, you've been listening to Garden Success. We're here every Thursday from 12 to 1. Uh, and we look forward to visiting with you again next Thursday. And by the way, I hope you enjoyed our last two tape shows. Those were really interesting. So go check them out online if you didn't listen in. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley. Garden Success is brought to you in part by the Arbor Gate, featuring unusual plants, artisan-created decorative pieces, and a constantly changing array of items that bring beauty, comfort, and even flavor to the home and garden. Arbor Gate, 15635 FM 2920, Tomball, Texas, 281-351-8851 or arborgate.com. Garden Success is also brought to you by the Farm Patch, 3519 South College Avenue in Bryan, 979-822-7209.